Okay, so our next, uh, our, our next presenter uh, is a terrific guy. His name is Greg Creed, and he is the CEO of Yum Brands. You've probably heard of, of some of uh, his, his restaurants. Um, they are KFC, they are Pizza Hut, uh, Taco Bell. Uh, he only has 45,000 of them, uh, so he's still working. He, say, he told me last night he's opening a restaurant like every 18 minutes or something like that. And so uh, he's still going, going strong. Um, they're in 135 uh, countries, uh, believe it or not, and uh, uh, he's been the CEO since 2011, and he had lots of positions before that coming all, all the way up to food chain, no pun intended, uh, and he, uh, had, he's been COO, Chief Operating Officer, he, he was uh, Chief uh, Concept Officer, uh, he was Chief Marketing Officer, and, I, and, and one of the great, I think, um, lines for, for, for any uh, business, any marketing messages, was to think outside the bun, and, and that, uh, that belongs to Greg and, and, and his team, and uh, so he's obviously a very, he's a very creative guy. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy uh, listening to him. Uh, he's, you know, he lives in Dallas now, so don't mind his Texas accent when you hear him, but uh, come on up, uh, Greg Creed. Well, good morning, everybody. So you've had, a, uh, you've had a Canadian, now you've got an Australian. <clears throat> so we're all going to start off with some Australians. So the first thing you're going to say is you're going to say, G'day, Greg. Okay? Everyone's going to do it. Ready? One, two, three. G'day, Greg. Okay, then I'm going to say ta, ta, which is T-A, actually is thank you. So you probably knew G'day, but you probably didn't know ta. So if you go to Australia and someone gives you something, you say ta, T-A. So that's something that you've learned. Um, so why am I here today? I don't actually get out very often to give presentations. Um, but I'm actually here primarily not to talk about brands. I'm primarily here to honor a very impressive man, and that's Terry Lundgren. And um, I haven't known Terry as long as a lot of you, all, and he, I've just got to know them in the last couple of years. I think with all that's going on with diversity and inclusion and women in leadership and male role models, it's very important to honor the people that I believe have the highest values and are setting the best standards. So, Cherry, on behalf of all of the male CEOs, I want to congratulate you. I mean, such a role model for everybody. <clears throat> so, I'm here to talk about creating relevant, distinct, and easy brands. And the reason I think this is important is we've had a lot of discussion. I think I missed yesterday, but I heard this morning. There's a lot of discussion about connecting and customer experiences and digital and e-commerce and all those things. But what are you actually connecting you, connection requires two things. The qu connection requires the customer, but what is the customer's connection to? And the answer is brands. And so what I want to do is talk about the importance of brand building. Uh, because I think at the end of the day, we can get caught up with the execution of what we're trying to do. If we don't actually build and empower and make our brands more relevant, distinct, and easy, then I think we're actually losing the game. And no matter how well we try to execute, if the fundamental brands aren't relevant, they aren't distinct, and they aren't easy, then I think it's all for naught. So that's really what I want to talk about. And the subtext of what I want to talk about is that in retail is that I think we have a, a challenge. And the challenge is how do you drive sales overnight and build brands over time? And often some people are really good at driving sales overnight and they're not so good at building brands over time. And some people are great at building a brand over time and they're not so good at driving sales overnight. But the quintessential success criteria for me is really simple. Drive sales overnight, build brands over time. That's what I want to talk about. So, as Terry said, we have 45,000 restaurants in 135 countries. We open a KFC every eight hours. Um, we will open 2,000 restaurants this year. Um, and while I don't own many of these 45,000 restaurants, which I'll talk about, we would probably do about $50 billion in sales uh, if you add them all up. So it's a pretty, pretty big business. Um, I'm going to just quickly get through this. This is not to, to bore you with the vision and the mission of Yum, but a lot of it is all about a world with more Yum and also about brands. It's about brands. And what I want to share with you is this. We have four growth drivers at Yum. There are only four things we focus on. And in fact, I say to the organization, if you're focusing on anything else, you're focusing on the wrong things. And the very first one, and the one I'm going to talk about today, is how to build distinct, relevant, and easy brands. The second one is bold restaurant development. How do you become a developer of the scale we do, which I'm not going to talk about, but how do you open a restaurant every eight hours? The third is how do you execute those restaurants? So in our case, largely franchisees executing those restaurants. 
because by the end of this year, we'll own less than 1,000 restaurants. And then what's critically important is what I call unrivaled culture and talent. Because I love it when people say, what business are you in? And my answer is, I'm in the people business. We're all in the people business. Because if you don't attract the right people, no matter what anyone says on this stage, nothing's going to happen if you don't truly believe in culture and talent. So they're the four growth drivers, and it's really going to be my pleasure to talk to you about the first one, which is how do we drive distinct, relevant, and easy brands? Now, this is just, oh, someone threw this in probably from corporate, so we'll just quick through these, you know, yeah, we're going to be all, so, okay. I'm a huge believer in less is more. I'm a huge believer in less is more. Nothing worse, if you think about, think about your childhood, um, you, well, first of all, you think about all the things you learnt when you couldn't read and write, nursery rhymes, right? So you learn a nursery rhyme when you couldn't read and write. Then you go to school and we destroy you, right? You start with a word and then you can do a phrase and then you can do a sentence, then you can do a paragraph. And then if you do a PhD, God, anyone have a PhD before I knock PhDs? <laughs> you have to write like 50,000 words. But the more you write, the less clear you are. The less you write, the more clear you are. And so the key is to write less, less is more. So this is the one page brand essence that drives the 21,000 $30 billion business called KFC. And we don't write it like I was taught at Unilever or we get taught at Procter & Gamble. We talk about our story and our world. What's the story that we've got to tell and what is the context of the world that we have to tell it in? I'm not going to take you through this, but you'll probably see in the subtext there that what we do and say makes us relevant and easy, and on the other side, how we say it makes us distinctive. I'm going to come back to that. So everything we do has to be wired around distinct, relevant, and easy. At Pizza Hut, it's actually simpler. We want to make it easier for everyone to get a better pizza. It's that simple. And at Taco Bell, you could argue we're not even a food brand. You know, we're a culture-centric lifestyle brand that happens to sell craveable, affordable, Mexican-inspired food. And our mission at Taco Bell is to be a category of one which I think is a really important thing to think about, which is we just don't want to be like anybody else. So I think there are three dimensions to modern marketing. And here we go. So what makes you relevant? What makes you distinct? And what makes it easy? So the question about relevance is, relevance dictates what you do and say as a brand. So is the brand relevant to my life? Does it address real issues that I have in my life? Can I engage with the category? It's sort of, it's what do I say as a brand? In terms of distinctiveness, it's, it's how do we do it? How do you become distinctive? What do you say? So does my brand look and feel unique? How ownable is it? How salient does it make my product? The other interesting thing about my business as a retailer is I actually don't buy any finished product from anybody. I actually buy ingredients that actually have to make all the products that I sell. So I'm not like Best Buy where I buy a Samsung TV and retail it. I actually have to go and make the TV. Um, so we also have to think about from a product point of view, how does the distinctiveness of the product lead to the distinctiveness of the brand? And then ease is all about, is it easy to order? Can I, is it easy to afford? I do think that people, you know, one of the challenges we have is we are often not our customers. Maybe Karen is a customer at Neiman Marcus, but we are not our customers. I don't know whether you know, but the average, this came out the other day, 43% of Americans would have trouble paying an unexpected $1,000 bill. So if they got, an in, they, they got a thing for $1,000, 43% of Americans would struggle to pay it. So I know the life we live, even as students, um, it can be very different from our customers. And so you can never forget the fact that affordability is a critical thing. But I'm going to talk about affordability later as to whether it's an apology or whether it's actually a compliment. And I think there's two ways to treat value. Uh, can I get my product easily? So sort of what Ease does is it talks about, you know, pricing, access strategies, and all that sort of stuff. So let's talk about relevance. I think there are really only two ways to get relevance. It's either through the product and the asset or through the message. And so, for example, we relaunched our KFC business, which in the U.S. about four years ago was a complete train wreck. There's no other way to describe it. And it used to really annoy me because... Everybody here would go to KFC US and say, what a crappy brand. And I would say, but outside of the US, it's this amazing brand. And then four years ago, with a remarkable team in Louisville, they really turned around and made the brand relevant. It was pretty clear. 60% of millennials had not eaten KFC. And so we went on an absolutely focused journey to make, the, to make the brand more relevant. 
both in terms of what we were offering, flavors that we were offering rather than traditional flavors, but also just the way we're doing it. And what's interesting, and you can probably see some of the actors up there, Rob Lowe, um, we've had George Hamilton, who was our extra crispy colonel. <laughs> what's really funny is we actually have now people who want to be the colonel. We don't actually have to go out and ask for people to be the colonel, they actually want to be the colonel. And in fact, if you think about it, we've even had our first female colonel. So let me just... Smoky mountain barbecue Fried chicken so crispy and tender Crispy fried chicken pie. Stop, stop, I can't do this. I thought if I dressed up like a country music legend, it would help KFC sell my delicious new Smoky Mountain Barbecue. Try it in the tender's basket for just $4.99. It was really interesting that, you know, why does the Colonel have to be a man? That's right, that's right. Um, it's been incredibly successful for us. Equally, when you're talking about, um, you know, the traditional belief is that fast food is for young people. And that if you dared show anybody who wasn't young having fun and enjoying your food, that would be a recipe for disaster. Well, have a look at what we did in Australia with KFC. So you can sell 24 nuggets for a price, or you can sell 24 nuggets for a price. Um, that was one of the most successful product uh, windows we've ever run. And there's no one young, there's no one hip, there's no one cool. Um, but the reaction was the reaction that you all, all gave. Assets, um, obviously, we have 45,000 of them around the world. Uh, the big challenge for us is that as millennials urbanize, we've traditionally built freestanding drive-through businesses. And so we've also been forced to look at our assets and work out how do we urbanize them. Um, the, so KFC, which obviously it, most of you would be aware of, is a freestanding drive-through business, but we're obviously building these uh, you know, small shop concepts. The one I want to talk about is the Cantina, which is the Taco Bell idea, which we've actually taken. We've got about 20 of these in the US right now. Uh, that one's actually uh, not far from my house in Orange County. Um, what's interesting about them is there's no drive-through. It has most of the menu, but we also sell alcohol. Um, and not only do we sell alcohol, we actually sell a proprietary beer called Pacific Bell. This is actually a microbrew beer. Uh, it's brewed in Long Beach for us. And what's interesting is that uh, in a traditional Taco Bell, uh, drinks are about 17% of our sales. And we all know, if you don't know, we make a lot of money selling drinks. Uh, in the cantina, drinks are 30% of sales. And 80% of the beer that we're selling is Pacific Bell. So people could come to Taco Bell for a unique experience and actually have a proprietary beer. Um, that's an idea that we're now actually expanding not outside of the US and in fact um, Spain, uh, India. In India we actually sell hard shakes. So you can actually get a milkshake, uh, an alcohol based milkshake. Um, uh, and so long as you're over 21 or 18 or depending whatever the heck you happen to be. And then in Pizza Hut, you know, we've got a lot of these old red roofs uh, which really don't define the brand. They define the brand of yesteryear and so we're really on this massive program to essentially um, deliver what we call this fast casual Delco. It's essentially a Delco, it's a delivery unit inside that has some seats. Uh, we deliver a nine inch pizza and a drink for like five dollars. I think if you go to Blaze it's about nine dollars. So we think we can offer this incredible value, re-image these assets, make ourselves more relevant, which is what we're talking about, to a, a millennial group that isn't living in the suburbs like we all did when we grew up. So let's talk about distinctiveness. How does my brand look and feel? How ownable is it? How salient is it? So what makes a brand distinctive? Well, what makes a brand distinctive is being different, being ownable, and being consistent. So I want to take you through in a minute a little case study, but before that, it's interesting, there's, a whole, there's some really great books on this, and I, I haven't read them all, to be honest, but it's something, it's, if something is easier to recall, it's more likely to be true, it's more likable, and it's more important. So if you can make it easier to recall your brand or your product, and I'll give you some examples, um, at Taco Bell, we, we launched the Naked Chicken Chalupa. The Naked Chicken Chalupa is where the shell is actually made of chicken rather than made of essentially whatever the hell we make our you know, flour and dough and everything else, right? So I got asked this question, which was, do you think the Naked Chicken Chalupa will do very well? Well, the good news is we test everything before we launch it, so I knew the answer was yes. 
But I said, well, if you're trying to sell something to a 21-year-old male, and the first word is naked, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a huge success. <laughs> and uh, I honestly don't think in retail we put enough thought into what we name things. We tend to give brands very functional names, or products very functional names. Yet, I would argue we don't do things for functional reasons. And so trying to find evocative names is actually a really a part of the process that I think a lot of people sort of jump through too quickly. If you remember nothing else about this presentation, I want you to remember this. Distinctive brands are magnets, not mirrors. I think a lot of people try to create brands that reflect the consumer they're trying to appeal to. That ad I showed you from Australia does not reflect really the people we're trying to appeal to. But it made that brand a magnet. And too often, and I look around because I'm like a, I'm the journeyman of watching other brands, is that I think far too often we believe that what we have to do is reflect our customer. But if you're in a competitive set that has the same customer, and you're all reflecting the same customer, how on earth are you distinctive? You can't be distinctive. What you've got to be is you've got to understand what your brand stands for, which is why we go through the whole process, you know, the brand essence for each of the brands. And then what you've got to do is decide, what is it going to make, what do I do that makes me a magnet? To attract the people that are actually attracted to my brand, not for me to reflect the people that so-called everyone else is trying to appeal to. This is really important, and I think a lot of brands fail because they just basically try to reflect what they've been told the target audience is and not to act as a, a, as a magnet for the people that you want to be drawn to. So I'm going to just take you through a little case study that's got nothing to do with fast food or, or retail, to be honest. Um, I'm going to talk about Virgin, and Virgin Atlantic in particular. So I just want you to have a look at that. So what do you all see? I need some active participation in the audience now. Yeah, um, what brands do you see up there? You see American, yeah, what else? And British Airways. What's interesting, most people never even see the British Airways. They're over on the right. I mean, is that not a world of, how many Alps, snow-covered Alps can you fly over? <laughs> I'm surprised the planes didn't crash into each other flying over the same snow-covered Alps, trying to take the same boring photograph as everybody else. Now, this, is Virgin Atlantic to the airport and make it swanky, no ordinary premium economy. Make it an adventure, make it epic. Life doesn't come to you, so go get it. Now, what's really interesting is that they look, feel, and act differently than the rest of the category, which goes back to being a magnet, not, not a mirror, okay? This is what it's all sort of being driven back to. Here's what's more important. Does it actually drive results? Well. In 1993, this is a spontaneous brand awareness, so Virgin was 50 whatever, we'll call it 54, British Airways was whatever, we'll call it 87. In 2009, now it's important, British Airways has 10 times the number of planes flying as Virgin. So imagine if you were in retail, someone had 10 times the number of outlets you've got. But in this case, Virgin Atlantic has more spontaneous brand awareness with one-tenth of the amount of assets as, as British Airways. So being distinctive actually works. What a surprise. What a surprise. Okay, we said about Taco Bell being a lifestyle brand. And so what does a lifestyle brand mean to us? Well, in the top left corner is the cantina, which is uh, on the strip in Las Vegas, where not only can you buy beer and alcohol and Taco Bell, you can get married. Yes, we will marry you for $600, and we don't care. We have his and hers, his and his, and hers and hers outfits, so we're uh, completely open to every opportunity. The bouquet is made of sauce packets. <laughs> we throw in all the food, and does anyone want to guess how many people we've married? We've married well over 100 people in a Taco Bell I think that sort of makes you a lifestyle brand. <laughs> Forever 21, we just did a, a program at Taco Bell with Forever 21 where we actually had clothing in a number of uh, Forever 21 stores. It sold out in days. In fact, the online part of it, one of the, the hoodies sold out on, on the first day. Go to the middle, we're about to launch chips. You will find Taco Bell chips and nacho chips in your Kroger, Walmart, C stores, hopefully Walgreens if they want to take it. 
I can actually probably get something out of this today. I get a sale. Um, and so why, why we wouldn't limit you to having a Taco Bell experience just at a Taco Bell? Why not deliver a Taco Bell experience through chips? So we're launching the uh, Mild, Fire, and Classic um, and have very high expectations for that. Um, and then, as you can see, everything else. You know, it's interesting, um, in beverages, we, um, we were sitting down one day and we said, what is it that we eat that we'd like to drink? We're sort of like, that's what we do at Taco Bell, just what would we like to drink that we eat? And the answer was candy. And so we started playing around with, well, what if we made drinks that were can you know, from candy? And so this is, actually, it's a great story because uh, Mars owns Starburst, Mars Confectionery. So we phoned up Mars Confectionery and said, hey, we'd like to launch a Starburst freeze. And they said, oh, we don't sell one of those. We said, no, no, we know you don't. We, we would like to do it and use your Starburst. Now, what's interesting is we didn't pay, even pay a license fee. How good was this? They were like, oh, I guess that's OK. Um, <laughs> so they now do charge us a license fee. The very first one we did was actually a, the pink strawberry flavor. Not the biggest selling uh, uh, Starburst flavor, but the one that looked the most visually sort of arresting. So we went down to the beach at Laguna Beach. We simply shot it. We did no TV behind this, and we sold three times the volume of Starburst freezers and created this entire range of... And if you think we make a lot of money selling drinks, think about how much we make selling aerated drinks. <laughs> OK. Um, part of making yourself distinctive is when you try to launch something that you're the 107th person to do. And that was fries. So we had not launched fries for a very long time for a number of reasons. But we decided we'd get into the fry business. And if you're going to be the 107th person to launch them, you better be distinctive. So this is how we did it. And you'll notice we have our own production company, actually called Live Must Productions. So this is how we did it. Daddy! I want fries. Honey, Taco Bell doesn't have fries. I wonder why not. Delicious. Someone doesn't want you to taste them. Big fries have been riding the ketchup train for 50 years. Now you come poking around about Mexican spices, nacho cheese sauce. You've made someone very, very salty. The kid's getting close. So scare him off. Daddy, look. Honey, where did you get that? The clown gave it to me. Why are you doing this? Taco Bell's nacho fries are a threat to their monopoly. And you know too much. Nacho cheese sauce? Mexican spices? They don't want these coming out. Who's they? The burger people. They. They! These nacho fries are consuming you. Looks like you got yourself in some hot oil. Yeah. So I think that's how you make yourself distinctive. And look at the production values to sell a $1 product. <laughs> no, I think it's serious. I think I'm going to talk about this a bit later, which is when we get to value, everyone sort of like dumbs down everything and treats it as like it's an apology rather than a celebration. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. Ease. Easy to order, easy to afford, easy to get. Um, we are obviously behind Domino's. I make no bones about it. Um, we forgot that uh, easy beats better. We thought better beat better, and we're in the better pizza business, and Domino's have done a really good job on us, but the good news is we're fighting back. And this is the great thing about business. It's always unfinished, so there's always plenty to do. Um, oops. Oh, th so this is... Oh, yeah. Just watch this, and I'll tell you what it's all about. So you really want to spend some time? Yeah.
I should have said that. Uh, we actually spent $10 million to set up a skunks works in Paddington Station in London. We took these people who didn't live in a Yum building or a, one of the brand buildings and set them up as if they were a skunk works and basically said reinvent the whole customer experience for Pizza Hut. Um, the really exciting thing about this is they produce an amazing piece of work and I actually think sometimes we have to accept that maybe the best work won't get done within the classic corporate structure and we have to allow ourselves to get out of our corporate structure in order to find success. What's also exciting is that our same store sales growth in the UK has exponentially grown. Uh, we're now exporting that to other, other places in Europe. So a lesson for us is you don't have to do it the same way. Everything doesn't have to be the same way. And I think this time, stepping out of our comfort zone, stepping out of the US, stepping out of a building that we would normally put people in really has delivered an amazing piece of work. Value, um, as I spoke about earlier, 43% of Americans would struggle to pay a $1,000 bill. Value remains critically important. And this is just some examples of how we do value. But the point I want to make is I'm going to show you a piece of advertising. I, f I honestly believe that when brands run value, they almost are apologizing. It's almost like, well, I'm really sorry I've got to do this, but I've got to sort of do it to drive sales. Rather than celebrating the fact that for a lot of people, these are great, great price points that enable them to feed their family and have a wonderful experience. And what I really like, particularly on the Taco Bell brand that we've done, is I'm going to show you an ad that basically celebrates a $1 value menu. But again, I want you to look at the production values behind it. I'll have to click this again, probably. From breakfast to late night, 20 decadent cravings like the bacon grilled breakfast burrito and shredded chicken mini quesadilla. Dollar all day at Taco Bell. Let the feast begin. Just think about the words that we use in that ad, evocative and feasts, and there's nothing apologetic about that. That's a celebration. And I honestly believe we can all learn that value should be celebrated. That we shouldn't actually be ashamed that we have to do value. Okay, easy to access. I want to get through this. So you, we all, I don't want to talk about it. I'm sure it's been talked about a lot. Subscription service, delivery aggregators. We just made a uh, $200 million investment in Grubhub, um, uh, which we own 3% of the company. We have a board seat. Uh, what was really exciting is the day we announced the investment, Grubhub went from a, eight bill a $7 billion company to a $9 billion company, uh, which was fantastic. Um, Obviously, so now I want to just link back to what I said earlier about how do you drive sales overnight and build brands over time. So let me just, I'm just going to click through this and then I'll talk to it. This is why I think relevance, distinctiveness and ease is so important. Because ease and distinctiveness, I really do believe, drive sales overnight. And distinctiveness and relevance, I really do believe, drive brand over time. So if you are not focused on relevance, if you are not focused on distinctiveness, and you are not focused on ease, then I don't know how you drive sales overnight and build a brand over time. Conversely, if you're doing a great job at driving sales overnight and you're not doing a great job in your company of, of building a brand over time, my suggestion is you probably need to look at relevance or distinctiveness, but probably relevance. If you're doing a great job of driving you know, a brand over time uh, and not sales overnight, you're probably not doing a great job of ease. It's a very simple formula, I think, to help identify where do we need to focus in order to deliver on both of those attributes. And then I have what I call my relevant and distinctive map, which I try to keep things, as I said, really simple. Dis distinct and relevant brands are what I call the magnetic originals. You can have distinct and irrelevant, and they're the oddballs. You can have relevant and not distinct, that's the conventionalist, that's where you fall asleep. And then you've got the irrelevant and the not distinct, which is wallflowers. What I decided to do was to actually put our own brands on this. And this is from over time. I, didn't, I actually originally had competitors and then I thought better of it. So I would argue that um, the Reba McIntyre KFC kernel ad is both relevant and distinctive. For some of you, because you're too young, you weren't even born, we used to run a dog for Taco Bell, which was incredibly distinctive. But what, and I'm going to run the ad because some of you are so young you've never probably seen it. Um, but we had the worst sales growth in the seven years we ran this campaign. We, went, we won more awards for being marketing geniuses than you can imagine, except it didn't drive sales. And then the last one is 
you know, whether it's buckets or pizzas, which are essentially, they're relevant, but they're just not distinctive. So I just want to finish with, I just, because I even I like watching this Taco Bell ad. And with that, I'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Yes. That was a, a great presentation. Um, it, it, and it was really resonated. One of the things, and I'm not sure how familiar people are in the room around, I guess there was a situation earlier this year in England um, where you guys ran out of ran out of chicken. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good. It, it was not good, but I, I was hoping you could elaborate a sure. little bit on your response to that because I thought from a marketing perspective what you did was absolutely genius. And yeah. I'll let maybe you, you tell sure. the story. And also just kind of talk through then how your environment and the culture of the organization helps fit into a response like that because I, it definitely now resonates when you, when you talk through around sure. especially things like distinctiveness. Okay, so the context is we changed distributors and unfortunately, on the day we changed distributors, the distributor just collapsed. Their, their IT system collapsed, their distribution system collapsed, everything just collapsed. And so it's not very good when you don't have chicken in a chicken chain, right? That's sort of pretty <laughs> fundamental. Uh, so we ran an ad, uh, and we just took KFC, and we said, FCK. <laughs> um, we're sorry. And then we proceeded to, in not so it's such evocative language, explained that we'd been complete idiots and stuffed it up, right? And um, it won a lot of applause. I have to say, some people internally were not comfortable. Some people internally thought it was um, not our greatest piece of work. Um, but I think to answer your question, uh, what underlies the culture and the sort of thing I tell is that we need leaders with three attributes, smart, heart, and courage. And I, that's another story for another day. But what I try to make sure is that people understand we need to be courageous. And so that was a great act of courage to run FCK, knowing what everyone knew it actually meant. Um, and it was OK. It would have been OK in the old days. Just you know, it ran in the UK. It could have run in Australia. But we're a, we're a US-based company, and you know, values are not exactly the same. Um, but the, the response I've got, or we've got, is overwhelmingly positive. And, I think it came from our culture of being courageous. And you probably see that in some of the ads that, we've, that I showed you today as well. Yeah, there's a lady in front. Okay. Or? I have, I have a oh. mic here. Oh, sorry. Hi, so I worked on your business on the, um, on the Pizza Hut business about 15 years ago. Gotcha. I'm right here. Gotcha. And uh, we went around through an agency in Chicago. We went around the country interviewing your customers. Uh -huh. And I was really struck by how in making the decision to first have pizza and then choose Pizza Hut, yep. that this uh, notion of sitting around the table, mm -hmm. gathering around the table was such a strong driver and resonates so much with their you know, connection with yep. the brand. And I didn't hear you talk too much about that, but do you still find that today? We almost wanted to pass a hat around and buy these poor people a table because it seemed like they didn't have a table to gather around at their home. Yeah, I think it's actually more, I didn't talk about, I should have shown you some execution for Pizza Hut, but I think uh, given um, the importance of connectivity in a human-to-human -human way, not through a technology way, is actually really important. And we've actually had to overcome some of our own myths. One of our myths was that poorer people took carry-out because it was cheaper, and richer people did delivery because you've got to pay a delivery fee, and you've also got to pay a tip to the driver. Myth wrong. Uh, because what happens is, people who maybe don't have as much money, actually that, de that delivery experience is the equivalent of us going out to a fine dining restaurant. And so if they had to drive half an hour and get the pizza, then it's half an hour that some member of the family is not with the family. And so we've actually had to challenge our own myths. And I think that's one of the other great things is, you know, you have to challenge the myths that you've all grown up with, because sometimes these myths change. Um, and the reasons people do things are not the reasons either you do them or the reasons you believe others do. But sitting around eating a pizza is still sort of sharing experiences. It still is today. Yeah. Hi, it's Rachel. First of all, I could listen to you talk all day. You're amazing. But my question is the smart heart and courage. How do you 
um, incentivize and encourage people in more junior roles within the company to take risks and be courageous because the outcome isn't always success, right. um, but you need that courage to push boundaries. So how do you incentivize that internally throughout the organization? Sure, well there's two ways. One is we talk, I talk about it a lot. So I actually teach a one day class, on, it's called Leading Culture to Fuel Results. And in that class, and I've taught it all around the world, in that class I talk about smart heart and courage and smart is IQ and EQ and heart is having a huge heart and courage is you know, you, you, you can't have the absence of fear to be courageous. What we give everybody at Yum is you get two scores. You get a performance score and you get a culture score. Um, so at the end of the year, you get a performance score for what your KPIs were, and then we give you a culture score. Uh, and your culture score is, you could argue, is very subjective. And the lawyers don't like it because it's not objective at all. But it's an assessment of basically how aligned are you with the culture. And so if you see people making courageous decisions, they're gonna get a better culture score than people who, who don't. So it's, not, it's imperfect, but I think if you give people a score at the end of the year, now we don't give you a score out of 10, we actually have uh, four scores. Learning if you're new, lacking, not good, living the culture, and then leading the culture. Um, and so we say if you wanna get promoted, you gotta have great performance and you gotta be a leader of the culture. Um, and therefore you're gonna have to be a leader of smart heart and courage. And that's the way we reinforce it. Yeah, I think there's a lady who's been trying to ask a question. Um, oh, I got yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, thank you. Um, the Cantina brand, yeah. is that something that is um, kind of a pilot test thing, or is this really rolling out, and what markets in the U.S. are you targeting? No, this is really rolling out. We, have, we started in Chicago. We're now in San Francisco, Cleveland. Uh, we're about to do a big expansion in New York. How you about think Texas? Uh, well, I live in Dallas, so there's a pretty good chance you'll get one because I'm sick of driving to my own drive through so that's the great thing about being the boss. Um, but in all serious, uh, so we think we can build 500 in the U.S. Um, I'll give you, the best example is New York City. There's like seven or eight million people live in New York City. We had two licensed stores. That's ridiculous. We think we can build 40 or 50 cantinas. Um, and selling alcohol is obviously, it's a huge, both a huge, um, makes us more distinctive but it also um, makes us more relevant because um, you know, people really do love to eat you know, beer, and pe beer and tacos and a whole bunch of stuff. So it's, it's way beyond uh, concept testing. We're in the massively rollout stage. Yeah, is that it? Or? Uh, I have one oh, here. Sorry. Um, on your Uno Mas production, high production uh, video there, um, how much of that was brand versus actually driving uh, fry sales? And then the second question is how do you balance brand uh, advertising versus kind of the short-term promo sales? Well, you probably saw in that ad, we don't ever run, I think we've only run once an ad that I would call a brand ad that didn't have either a retail product or a price point attached to it. That was when we were relaunching from Think Outside the Bun to Live Mass, and we did that on the Super Bowl. Uh, traditionally, you will always see a product and you will always, you, know, you won't always see a price point, but you'll always see a product. But it's not, here's the product and we wrap some story around it, it's like, here's the story and this is the story about the product. Um, to answer your question, uh, Nacho Fries was the largest, biggest success product we've ever launched at Taco Bell. Um, so when, you, when you're the last person in the fries, you're essentially launching a commodity. We made it not quite as commoditized through, um, obviously, the spices and the nacho cheese. But uh, we've been incredibly happy with the performance of Nacho Fries. We've taken them out because we couldn't sustain them. We, they were doing so well. So we actually have to come back and, and add them as a permanent menu item. So, I would say they've done incredibly well. Um, very happy with them. I think, is that it? Oh, well, one more and then I'll go. Thanks so much for speaking. Uh, very interesting. Uh, just had a quick question. With such a large footprint and the actual human customer service element being so important, uh -huh. um, how do you really drive that in your restaurants um, and keep employees engaged on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, that's, I mean, that's a great question. It, it's a tough one for us because, um, you know, we have in some businesses team member turnover 100%. In others, we have team member turnover of 10%, right? So um, I think the most important thing is for every team member to understand what the brand essence is. Uh, so those one pages, it's critically important, if you work on the KFC brand or the Taco Bell brand or the Pizza brand, that you truly understand what, you, what is the essence of the brand that you're trying to communicate in everything we do. So I'm not a huge believer in, you know, everyone gets greeted the same way or thanked the same way because that's not how people want to be treated. You know, the old saying, you know, you should treat everyone like you want to be treated is the worst thing in the world. The only person who wants to get treated like you is you. 
Everybody, everybody wants to get treated like they want to get treated. So I'm not a huge believer in, you know, we all have to say hi, welcome, you know, whatever. It's sort of like, if you understand the brand essence, then express the brand essence through your own uniqueness as an employee and give the customer a unique experience. And it's a little risky because it's much easier to say, did you say, you know, welcome within three seconds and, you know, howdy doody and all those sort of things. But it shouldn't be about measuring howdy doody and if you said welcome, it should be about the customer experience. And so that's the way we try to, are we perfect at it? No, we're not. We have some great restaurants and in 45,000 we have some horrible ones. Um, it's just sort of the law of big numbers, right? But, um, you know, it's an area that we continually try to prove. Now, do we have processes in the back of house? Absolutely. Are there non-negotiables on food safety and, and how you cook chicken and all that sort of stuff? At that, you don't get to choose how to do that. But from the customer experience point of view, you very much get to understand the brand essence, bring your own personality, and deliver someone a unique experience. Thank you all very much. Yeah.